progress. Good morning, everybody. This is the Wednesday, October 6, 2021 morning session of the Portland City Council. Keelan, good morning. Please call the roll. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Maps. Here. Rubio. Ryan. Here. Hardesty. Here. Wheeler. Here. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the council are attending remotely by video and teleconference and the city has made several avenues available to the public to participate in this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the city's YouTube channel, eGovPDX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and to promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all, as usual, for your patience, your flexibility, and your understanding as we manage through these challenging circumstances to conduct the city's business. And with that, we'll hear from uh, legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov forward slash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or ejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. Thank you. Thank you. First up is communications. Item number 726, please. Request of Pete Colt to address council regarding Elk Grove and efficiencies other cities are using. Welcome back, Pete. Hello there, everyone. How is everybody on the council today? You all doing good? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I hope you had a chance to call the mayor down there in Elk Grove. Uh, did you? I have had, we have done our research on Elk Grove. Yes, I came oh, from there. That's wonderful. And I you know, do with my our homework. All right. You know, with our shortage in the police department, I would encourage the council to consider again doing what they do down in Sydney, Australia and shifting some of the, pro uh, the problems that the police usually handle in our city over to uh, um, traffic, um, the uh, parking enforcement people, or maybe even create something like the, the Sydney Rangers, which are which we would take parking enforcement and convert it to uh, the Portland Rangers, who would have a wider uh, mandate to do things um, around the city. To, and we would be more proactive rather than having a complaint-driven system to have a system driven by people who are actually out on the streets every day, seeing what the problems are. Commissioner Hardesty, I wanted to talk to you in particular, please, because I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank you because you have two staff who report to you. Uh, one is a man named Steve Townsend, the other Townsend with, a, with no D, the other is a woman named Wendy Cauley. The reason I call them, please, is this. Um, the neighborhood on Northwest 18th, Northwest 19th, Northwest Everett, Northwest Gleason um, is in, in the inner city of Portland. By the way, in your own report, Commissioner Hardesty, in Northwest in Motion, which the city council voted to approve in November, um, the neighborhood I'm talking about has the highest concentration of, of people in wheelchairs, uh, blind people, people with handicaps, people who don't speak English as a first language, and uh, women and men of color. Uh, in this neighborhood. And because of that, there is a lack of equity in that particular area. What's happened is that um, the engineers took all of the traffic from that neighborhood and dumped it all on those streets, impacting that sleep of our neighbors in that 
neighborhood. Both those people, Townsend and Colley, heard what I was saying when I called to talk to them. And Ms. Colley sat there for a very long time saying, I'm not taking a for having people like that working under your neighborhood and installing more stop signs, especially around the schools anyway. that are in that neighborhood. So thank you for that, Commissioner. Um, thank Commissioner you, Peter. Maps, uh, I, think something Peter, I missed a lot of what you said because the sound quality was not good. Um, if you want to reach out to my office and have a conversation with one of my staff, I'm happy to yeah, have that. Um, should I call your office? Yes. That would be great. Yeah, will. Angelita will answer the phone and she will direct you to the appropriate person. Thank you. I will call Angelina. And again, thank you for being a good commissioner and taking care of, of the equity in that neighborhood. I appreciate that. Uh, commissioner thank Maps, you. I think something maybe, um, I think you're focused on rewriting the charter for the city, one of some of the, uh, which we really need to have done. I would encourage this current council when you consider rewriting the city charter to make the positions that you are in right now still um, for the next uh, two or three um, voting years, which would be maybe eight years to 12 years, make your positions still at large, voted citywide, so that there's a smoother transition from one type of government to the other. So the five of you could technically be commissioners and mayor for another up to 12 years. I think it's important for us to have a transition period as we move to a city manager. And uh, so I see my time is almost up. I want to say to the city council again, I can't thank you all, each and every one of you, for having the courage to run for office and to do the things that it's taken for you to get to where you are. Thank you. Pete, just uh, one quick update. Thank you for your testimony as always. Um, so I, in doing my research on Elk Grove, there, there were already some similarities between the work they do and the work we're doing here in the city of Portland. There are some distinctions. Uh, one of the core issues that they describe is paying houseless individuals to help with the litter collection. We've actually had a contract in place since April with a organization called Trash for Peace that does just that here in the city of Portland. It's slightly different because what they do in Elk Grove is they pay every two weeks with a prepaid card, whereas through Trash for Peace, we actually pay cash uh, on hand at that particular time. We also have programs like Clean and Safe and uh, the Homeless and Urban Camping Impact Reduction Program. Um, we also uh, are working on other ways uh, that are similar to what Elk Grove does around further engagement with people living on the streets to help improve the conditions in their own camps in the surrounding area. So I, I just want you to know that uh, I was pleased with the discussions we had with those uh, individuals who helped lead that program down there. Um, it, it seems like we're in alignment on a lot of key, key issues, and I just wanted to report that back to you. Uh, Commissioner Maps. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank Pete for um, his comments today and his thoughts on the on how to reform the charter. Uh, like you, I have a lot of interest in um, reforming our form of government. Um, I also want you to know that actually the recommendations for how the charter will evolve won't come from this council. Instead, we have an independent citizens group called the Charter Review Committee, which is actually working right now to develop recommendations, which they will ultimately put before the voters, I believe in November of 2022. Um, I really encourage you to follow that process. Um, okay. I, they have uh, monthly meetings that you can zoom into. I believe they take public testimony. Um, okay. And I hope that you will share uh, some of the ideas that you shared with us today uh, with them because they're the folks who are actually driving this process. Um, if you Google Portland Charter Review Committee, uh, okay. it should take you to the right link. And thank you for uh, testifying before us today and um, always. Thank you all very, very much. I hope you all have a really great day. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we'll do. You too, Pete. Thank you. Next individual, please. Bye -bye. Item 727. Request of Catherine Blackwell to address council regarding a project to help the disenfranchised houseless. Good morning. Catherine, are you there? 
Um, it looks like Catherine is not on the call. Yeah, I don't see her. Okay. Next individual, please, 728. Request of Colin Staub to address council regarding recent changes Bureau of Transportation has made to Hawthorne Boulevard. Hi, Colin. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, hope I'm joined here. Okay, well, hello. Uh, my name is Colin Staub, and I got hit by a car two weeks ago. And I got hit on my bike on a street the Portland Bureau of Transportation recently redesigned in the name of safety. And I've been biking on this street for 20 plus years. And in all of that time, I can say it has never been more dangerous than it is right now. The street I am referring to is Southeast Hawthorne Boulevard. And this is specifically the stretch that runs from the bridge up to 12th Avenue. It is a one-way street going east, and it used to have, from the left, a sidewalk, a parking lane, three driving lanes, a bike lane, a parking lane, and the other sidewalk. After the Bureau of Transportation was finished with it, the street now has, from left, a sidewalk, a sometimes parking, sometimes driving lane, a partial bus and turn lane that's painted red, a parking lane that's essentially in the street, and a bike lane on the other side of that parking lane, and finally a sidewalk. That's, that's about the simplest I can explain what's going on now. Two weeks ago, I was coming up the street around 3 p.m. In the span of three blocks, a box truck and another car separately took right turns without seeing me in the bike lane, which again is separated from them by a row of parked cars and a bus lane. Each saw me as they were partially turned and waved me on. Then I got up to 11th Avenue in front of the old Hawthorne liquor store, and here the city has installed a designated bike traffic light. When that light is green, the car turning lane light is red. The turning lane sort of emerges from the line of parked cars as you get close to the intersection. I have a green light, so I keep going. As I get to the intersection, the car waiting to turn ignores the no turn on red light and turns, and I slam into the side of his car. I would like to make two points about this redesign. And first is that the city can put down as much paint on lanes, put up as many signs and lights, and move parking lanes into the middle of streets. And despite all of that, People aren't necessarily going to follow the new rules, whether out of confusion or frustration or anger. Um, I think that needs to be taken into account when we're looking at these street changes. Simplicity is a great factor in safety, and it is one that the city has entirely ignored when redesigning streets like Hawthorne Boulevard. The redesign seems to rely on confusing drivers into slowing down. And that leads into my second point. Uh, the Hawthorne changes and the many similar projects the city has done elsewhere might have looked good on paper to someone at some point. The results are not good. Uh, so does the city have employees out there to witness what's actually happening? There was nobody from the Bureau of Transportation around when I got hit two weeks ago, but after all the money and time that went into reworking this street, I would hope there is some effort going into taking stock of the results and considering reversing the changes. Uh, I feel going back to the previous design would make Hawthorne Boulevard a much safer street, I hope I'm able to come back and testify again at some point, thanking you for removing these changes. And I'll avoid Hawthorne in the meantime to ensure I'm still around to be able to do that. Thank you for uh, listening to me today. Thank you very much. We appreciate your being here. Mayor? Uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, Colin, no. uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, Thank, thank you, you, Mayor. No worry. You had your head down. Um, uh, Colin, let me just say I'm so sorry you got hit. Uh, the speed of traffic all over the city of Portland is frightening for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and anybody who's riding anything other than a steel contraption uh, we call automobiles, right? So let me start there. The improvements on Hawthorne were safety improvements, uh, and they were, uh, they were um, prioritized by the community. Uh, the people who live, work, um, own businesses on Hawthorne, right? I wish we had had the resources to totally redesign Hawthorne because honestly, Hawthorne was not designed correctly from its inception based on all the uses that it has. Um, so we will continue to monitor all the changes that we're making, but I just wanted to really just say, sorry, you were hit. And it actually hopefully reminds drivers that they have an obligation and a responsibility to look out for people who are walking, who are biking, and who are using other modes of transportation. So appreciate I, you. I, I appreciate that. I, I thank you for that. I think it's, it's, as I said in my testimony, I think one factor that doesn't seem to be considered too often is that like when you're driving, when you're biking, you're making snap decisions, split yeah. second decisions, and the simple, like in having simplicity in how the road is set up helps with that. When you're confused, 
But the guy who hit me, he was more shaken up than I was. And he apologized profusely. He didn't know what was going on. I said, I know it's new. It's confusing. Um, I, you know, no one was, no one was trying to kill each other there, but the, right. the confusion that's been created through these lane changes and I, I go up it all the time. I don't know what's going on. So I, I would, I would hope that that factors into it. Well, I appreciate you uh, reporting back on your experience, and I will certainly make sure that I pass on that information to PBOC. Thank you Thank again you. for being here today. I appreciate that. Thanks, Colin. We hope you uh, hope you recover quickly from your Thank injuries. You. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, that concludes, does it not, communications, Keelan? Yes, that's correct. Let's move to the consent agenda. Have any items been pulled from the consent agenda? Yes, we've had a request for item 732. 732, and that was requested by council, correct? Yeah, by Commissioner Maps. Very good. Please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. Time certain item number 729. We're right on the button on top. Proclaim October 11th, 2021 to be Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you, Keelan. Uh, I'll turn this over to Laura John. She's our Director of Tribal Relations to introduce our guest speakers for this item. Welcome, Laura. Good morning. Uh, Laura, you're still muted. Of course I do that. That's all right. <laughs> Everybody's got to do it at least once per day. That's, Mark that's, that one down on my bingo it's, card. It's like the greeting in Zoom. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, can you hear me? Um, <laughs> I know you hear that one a lot. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Laura John, and I serve as the City of Portland's Tribal Relations Director in our Office of Government Relations. Um, very um, happy to bring forth this proclamation once again. Uh, this is the seventh uh, Indigenous Peoples Day proclamation that the City Council has uh, proclaimed. And we're very excited to continue uh, this as, as an annual um, uh, item on Council's agenda. I've invited a couple of special guests today. Um, we have Anna Marie Allen joining us from uh, Multnomah County, and Patsy Whitefoot from the Yakima Nation, who has been uh, very active in helping us with our uh, annual Tribal Nation Summit uh, and our MMIW work. Uh, and we also have uh, the Office of Government Relations Director, Brianna Fraley, joining us today as, as well. I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, have Anna provide her statement. Thank you, Laura, for the introduction for your steadfast dedication to ensuring Native people on reservations and off are represented and prioritized in local government. I appreciate you. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and council members. Again, for the record, my name is Anna Marie Allen. I'm a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribe from the Fort Hall Reservation, and I've grown up here in Portland. And I also am here today as the policy and engagement um, advisor to Chair Kafori over at Multnomah County. I appreciate the opportunity to virtually be here today. Of course, I know that we all say this a lot, wish we were in person, one day that will happen again. Um, I'm grateful for the city's dedication to elevating indigenous voices and policy change and development. The city of Portland chose to do that when the city council first decided to reclaim Columbus Day for indigenous people. That was an act of decolonization then and, and it's an act of decolonization today. And it shows that the city of Portland is dedicated to unlearning just as much as learning. And I think that's really critical. This year's proclamation raises awareness of the harm that was done by federal Indian policies that took children away from their families, took traditional languages and practices away from us and tried to eradicate an entire race. Reservations and boarding schools were used to silence and oppress native people. And yet we're still here. We have been here and um, we have been and still are the presence across the whole swath of the country. That's why proclamations like this are so important and why it's critical that local, state and federal governments continue to invest in policies and practices such as government to government consultation and prioritizing tribal, tribal people wherever they are. 
I'm excited and honored to be part of this work at Multnomah County um, in Chair Kofori's office. In the last budget cycle, Chair Kofori championed the funding for a new position within the county's Office of Government Relations, um, which will be dedicated to advancing policy and engagement activities that align with the priorities of Native people. And a big part of the county's advancing this work is, is due to Laura John. Um, from the beginning, Laura was, has made it a point to reach out to me and many others at Multnomah County to invite literally anyone and everyone to engage in learning and partnering. Um, from the creation of the Regional Tribal Affairs Collaborative to building awareness around the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls crisis to inviting county leadership to attend the city's first Tribal Nation Summit. Today, I would like to express my gratitude to the city, to the council, um, and for, ele for elevating the um, value of creating tribal relations programs in a local government. And I wanna thank Laura John for her leadership and partnership. My hope is that we can continue to unlearn harmful pra practices of systemic racism as we continue to invest in learning about, partnering with, and listening to our indigenous communities and tribal nations. I appreciate the invitation to speak today to acknowledge the work that has been done at the city and at the county um, and other local jurisdictions, as well as the work that still needs to be done and to build bridges while we celebrate and hold space for Indigenous Peoples Day. So let's continue to right the historical wrongs together. Ashendaga, thank you. Thank you, Anna Marie. Uh, our next speaker uh, that we had invited was Katie McDonald from Metro Regional Government. She is the... Um, New within the year, uh, Tribal Affairs um, uh, Policy Advisor in Metro's Government Relations Office. Uh, she unfortunately is not able to attend this morning, uh, but wanted to send her regards. And uh, I, I wanted to share that um, our Office of Government Relations worked closely with Metro's Government Relations to help them as they develop their position. and. Uh, they are now starting to look at hiring more positions in the different departments um, to work specifically with the Native community and with tribes. Very exciting work going on over there. Uh, this year in our proclamation, uh, we have highlighted an issue that has been very poignant for so many, maybe all Native people uh, in this country and in Canada. Um, the recent discovery of um, unmarked graves of thousands um, um, and thousands of, of other graves uh, have been discovered at former uh, boarding schools, residential schools that were federally run. Um, and that number continues to climb. Uh, in order to help raise awareness for this, we have invited Patsy Whitefoot to speak. She is a former member of a national coalition on boarding schools healing, and I'd like to call her forward to speak next. Good morning. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. And Laura's gonna share a PowerPoint for me. Is that correct? I wanna make certain it's up while I'm speaking. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, City of Portland Council, as well as the mayor. Good to see you all again. I'm pleased to be here once again, uh, speaking with um, you know consist constituents of the city of Portland. I just recently finished a training with the uh, Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board uh, staff as well. That was that was quite exciting to do that. But I'm back here to talk about the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies in the United States Act, which was which was just. Um, introduced September 30th uh, recently. So I'm just gonna do a brief overview uh, of that act and the work that we've been doing for several years to be at the place where we're at today. Uh, Laura, the next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, I'm introducing you this morning, Shikmaitsky, English, Winnick, Shesh, Twapit, Ku, Pashtun, Wiki, Patricia, Whitefoot. And as, um, as some of you know, I'm, it's not unusual for me to be traveling around here in the Northwest. And some days I'm at the river um, in this case, and I'm thinking about being at the river down by, um, you know, across from Hood River area, uh, out in my truck while my son and his family are out, out on the river fishing this wonderful morning. So I, there are days that I wake up at the river, just like my sister, you know, something we have in common with one another. Next slide. <clears throat> 
So with regard to uh, the boarding school issues, uh, it impacts all of us. And as I share this information, I just also want to call out the work that's been going on in the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And as we take a look at this map, you, you'll see it's a part of the, the Greater Columbia River um, Basin tributaries. And along this river, uh, along these various rivers are where our tribes live. And not only here in the Northwest, but also in Canada as well. And so we continue to work with First Nations relatives, particularly on this, this particular issue as we work toward building our Indian nations so that we have the right for self-determination. The next slide, Rose. So in this case, we're talking about the military schools. And so in the, the treaty making era with uh, the tribes here in the Northwest with Governor Stevens, uh, a military fort was built, which is about two miles to the west of where I live. And this is the beginnings of that. Well, this is one of the older buildings and these buildings still exist at the Fort Simcoe. The next slide, please, Laura. <clears throat> so as we think about that building, and I'm just gonna do a very brief introduction to boarding schools. And if um, you, you want to know more, I'd be glad to come, come back again into Portland and, and share more. And I've also been there before some of the, the Portland city uh, staff as well. <clears throat> so in 1852, and this is important to highlight the role of churches uh, uh, that come into our communities such as Yakima, and so in the Treaty of 1855, we did have a mission that was nearby here. And so these treaties were conducted by, you know, Stevens with many, many of our tribes in the Northwest. It wasn't just tribes like the Yakima Nation, but also the Warm Springs, uh, the Umatillas in Oregon, uh, the, the Nez Perce in Idaho. And so all, again, relationships, we have strong relationships with our relatives not only in the state of Washington, but throughout the region, including Canada. And of course, with, do, you know, with settler encroachment, war broke out and all of those things. And I could go into detail ab about this information, but it's important to pay attention to the treaty era. And because as we move into um, moving toward uh, what's gonna happen with the native people, if we look to 1860, the superintendent report said Indians need to be civilized and children are the most sal salvageable by assimilating them with education and taking uh, them from their families. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so in taking the children from their families, you know, we have this such, this, such an institution as the Fort Simcoe Military School. And here, uh, after the school opened in 1860, you'll see the, the young men here that are lined up outside the, the building here. Similarly, this is a place where um, my, my family was, my grandmother who raised me was at this military inst inst institution. And I was at a, another institution nearby about two miles to the east of me. The next slide, please. Okay, just some highlights while children were in the school. Uh, the Methodist Church was put in charge, and once you begin to understand the history of boarding schools, you'll begin to see the role of many uh, Christian organizations and churches. So in uh, the 1860s, 1890, two um, children's long hair was cut. Our Indian names were discarded. I shared my Indian name earlier. Uh, Christian names were given them, and they're baptized, so they have proper names. It's a very regimented military style. Similarly, the institution where I was was very military-like as well. And if children spoke their native language or used cultural attire, it was destroyed, children whipped and their mouth washed with lye. And uh, also the Indian police was responsible for rounding up the children and taking the children away from their families. And if they didn't comply, the Indian agent fined them, imprisoned or sentenced them to labor. And so uh, if children ran away, uh, they would face harsh punishment with whippings, which resulted in bruises and some children dying. And these are the stories that I grew up from my grandmother who was in the Fort Simcoe Military School. Next slide, please. And so as I look at this photo here, I'm always looking for my grandmother. I'm thinking, well, which one is she? She is of course no longer here. But I asked myself, which one is she? So she was born in 1905. 
And so she would have been here probably in 1910, you know, very young. It wasn't unusual for uh, children to be forced to into these um, military schools, you know, at the age of three. Next slide, please. And so uh, just a lot of history, you know, during this period of, in 1922, the school was closed. And so that's over 60 years, the school was on the reservation here. And after that, the children were sent to other boarding schools, such as Chamao Indian School in Salem, a long history that we have with the Chamao Indian School and other institutions. In 1924, interestingly enough, uh, Native Americans were granted citizenship. And why were we granted in citizenship? Uh, so that uh, Indians would be able to also pay taxes and the United States had the right to tax Native people. And so in 1934, you know, be after the, the Department of Interior is in place, 1934, we had the Indian Reorganization White Act, which affirms the Secretary's trust responsibility uh, through the Department of Interior. The next slide. And so the work that we'll be doing will be primarily with the Department of Interior. I just want to cite one statement that was uh, shared by a student uh, in an interview with Dr. Denise Laja Madari. In this case, this is a young Yakima girl who states, I was four years old when taken, when stolen and taken to Chamao, Oregon. The matron grabbed me and my sister, stripped off our clothes, laid us in a trough and scrubbed our genitals with sly soap, yelling at us that we were filthy savages, dirty. I had to walk on my tiptoes, screaming in pain. You know, when I first uh, read this and every time I read this, it just, you know, crushes my heart you know, to think about those stories because those are the stories that I grew up with as well. Next slide, please. So what are we about? And I agree with you know, some, many of the statements and you know, the work that the city of Portland is doing. I'm just gonna use this as an example because as a retired educator, I, I still advocate for the, the first kids policy agenda because the work that we're doing is about our children and lifting up our communities and families. And so we all want safe and supportive environments. We all want have healthy lifestyles. We want stable communities and we want successful students and families the next slide, and uh, uh, Mayor, I see that you know in your talking points that you share with communities and allies. And Joe, just a, a quick in my closing, I just want to really give a quick uh, journey of the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. So, in uh, I'm not going to go through everything. I'm just going to highlight in 2011, a symposium was held with the United States and Canadian leaders to discuss the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and goal to advocate for a U.S. Commission. And at the end of the day, that's where we are today. But I'm also looking at cities like Portland, Seattle, um, you know, Spokane. So early on uh, during my time with the coalition, and I'm still a part of the coalition, I'm a member of the coalition, you know, met, met with the Honorable Congressman Furs to gain support and advocacy with the churches. You know, I met with her there in Portland. And of course, she comes from the wonderful city of Port the Portland area. You know, had a very good response with her. And, and as we continue to do that work, we also gain support from the affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, the 56 Northwest tribes there in Portland, our offices there. And we also gain support from the National Congress of American Indians, National Indian Education Association, and many others. And you could go on the website of the coalition and see the kind of support that we receive. Uh, we've gained support from the Washington Faith Action Network, who also just the other day endorsed this bill when it came out. Uh, the city of Seattle provides support with the resolution, policies, city native in initiatives, and, and the work continues. I'm on the city of Seattle's uh, listserv as well. Other diverse communities have provided similar so support and looking forward to you know, support from the city of of Portland. But I leave this open because there are many opportunities that are, you know, available to all of us to, you know, to right the wrong, as I heard the previous speaker speak about. And so look forward to that opportunity. The next slide, Laura. <clears throat> next slide, please. Am I frozen? Are we frozen? Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought I was frozen and I was talking to myself. That's not unusual. <laughs> no, we, we heard you. It was, it was good. <laughs> we all had okay. that fear on Zoom. Is anybody out there? <laughs> <laughs> 
maybe uh, maybe Laura is frozen. So I'll just go on. I was completing this. I don't remember which uh, slide this is, but we're nearing we're at the end. But just you know, just opening up as you heard this, and I went through this very quickly. You know, I didn't go you know into the the historical and intergenerational trauma of what these boarding schools created. But it's not only the boarding school. It's all of the various uh, legislation that's been acted by Congress, all of these formal actions that are taken by the Supreme Court, um, and also the early colonization of the United States with um, the doctrine of discovery. There's so much history that's packed into all of this. <clears throat> and as, you know, as I shared, uh, I, I continue to work with young people, continue to do teaching, teacher training, uh, here in the Northwest and also at the federal level involved with advocacy work with Congress and the National Indian Education Association and organizations like the uh, Boarding School Healing Coalition. And so I uh, really look forward to working you know, with the city of Portland and allies you know, that you have there within uh, the city. And so I wanna say thank you for allowing me to be here with you and thank you to Laura for the support and uh, your, communi your ongoing communication. I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have a question. Mayor, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Hurst. Um, first, let me just say how heartbreaking a story, the, the legacy that you've shared with us is. I mean, I it's it was hard to not just kind of break out into tears when you think about the lived experience of Native children. And I've heard some horror stories from my friends, but, uh, you know, it's just the more we learn, the more horrific we realized it, it, it really was. My question is about the um, healing, the, the, the Healing Act and whether or not the Truth and Reconciliation, is that a federal request? Is that uh, yes. It, it, <clears throat> uh, yes, Councilman Hardesty, it's a part of the, the legislation that we have. And so uh, similar to what happened in Canada, mm -hmm. taking that same similar path. You know, I, I can't speak for my colleagues, but as a legislative agenda, we all have to agree to put it on our agenda, but I can't think of anything more important than to create a path for healing and acknowledgement uh, for the harm that was done. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will be talking to my colleagues about making sure we can add that to our federal legislative agenda. Thank, Thank you so, you much, so much. I really appreciate that. You're very welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. We wanted to highlight uh, the impact of boarding schools for a number of reasons uh, for this year's proclamation. Um, because of the recent uh, discovery of the graves, uh, because of the movement that is happening in DC right now to start this, this commission, um, and also to bring this to council to understand that when we are creating and, and our programs and services, and particularly for those programs and services that are for native Portlanders, we always need to keep this in mind. The disparities that we see that exist in uh, native communities is directly connected to this history and trauma of boarding school, the boarding school era. Um, every single Native person is affected by this. Uh, some of us are um, uh, very close to, in generation, uh, being descendants of uh, boarding school survivors. I can speak for myself, and I've shared this with council in the past. Uh, my grandfather was sent to Chamawa Indian School from, um, from Northern Montana. Um, he was then shipped down to Phoenix Indian School uh, during his eighth grade year, and it was so awful that he and his cousin uh, ran away and hoboed trains all the way back to Montana uh, as eighth graders. Um, that has impact that impacted his um, uh, ability to parent. Uh, it impacted his ability to uh, express love. Uh, his, it impacted his ability. Um, to know good parenting skills. Um, I also uh, have that 
uh, lineage on my father's side. Uh, my father was sent to Haskell, um, uh, which is in Lawrence, Kansas, from Western New York. Uh, after he was there, he never went back to live in his uh, in his community because he didn't feel like he fit in. Um, he went into the military and uh, also shared with me um, later in his life that uh, he didn't learn how to say I love you um, and had to learn all of that and that he was very proud of his children um, and how we were parenting our own, our own children, his grandchildren. Um, so what I would like to do is um, uh, bring up today that I am going to be speaking with Patsy uh, to arrange for a training for city employees on this issue. Uh, and I, I'd love, Patsy, thank you for putting the quote in there from Denise Lajmadere. Um, She's a former Portlander, um, attended Portland State University, and I'd love to reach out to her and see if we can have her help as well with the training for the city. So with that, I wanted to move to our, our final speaker um, and invite our uh, Government Relations Director, Brandon Fraley, to speak. Thank you, Laura and Patsy for those moving words and for Anna for, um, as, as well. Um, good morning, Hagi Yesham, Commissioners and Mayor. Uh, my name is Brandon Fraley and I'm an enrolled citizen of the Palawadini Nation. And as the Director of Government Relations, I'm honored to be here today to speak to and support the work of our Tribal Relations Office. My journey to the city is one built upon survivors of genocide and boarding schools. This shapes how I view the world and how I approach the work we do as a city. At the age of 10, my grandmother was captured and forced into boarding school, 13 hours away from her home in Riverside, California. There, she suffered the lightest of punishments. For speaking her language, the punishment was peeling a gunny sack of onions until she couldn't see. Determined to come home, she ran away with a Pomo girl. They made it to her friend's village where she was able to go home and her parents came to rescue her. Fast forward when my mom was a child, she remembers playing a game called hide hide. The rules were simple. Whenever a car came to the house, all the children would just scatter and hide in the bushes. Years later, my mother realized her grandmother was protecting her from the government Indian agents that were looking for children to take to boarding school. I wonder how this affects me. Generations of hiding, distrust, and full of questions. I often get asked, how can I work for a government knowing what they did to us? My answer is simple. I am here to be the voice of my ancestors and to advocate for change in systems and structures that were set out to kill the Indian and save the man. I am a lucky one, a descendant of the largest documented massacres in US history, the, Ment the massacre at Yantucket, the genesis of my people, a survivor of the boarding school era and a first generation college graduate. I believe it is my responsibility to speak truth to power hold space and honor our relations who will, ne who will never know. Today, I wear orange, excuse me, to bring awareness to the murdered children who are captured, enslaved, beaten, and disgracefully buried. In my role as a director, I carry these memories with me. And I question how can I contribute to Indian country and be an ally in the effort of indigenous communities and tribal nations. We are taking action here at the city, and I am proud to be here to serve you. By committing to anti-racism and the core values of the city, by investing and in training to bring awareness, like the employee summit that Laura has diligently worked on that will be hosted tomorrow. Um, by building a framework for tribal relations to be a thought partner with Laura and the work she does. Developing a tribal work plan that will lay out a strategy of how we can be I look forward to being a thought partner with my colleagues at the city, city council, tribal nations, and communities as to how we envision, envision an indigenized future here at the city of Portland. Shuknu Juanin Thank you.
uh, for your time today and uh, the ability to let me share my personal experience and how that informs the work I do for public publicity. Thank you, Director Fraley. So to close out uh, our presentation, I wanted to bring this all together. The city has made a commitment to tribal relations and it is very uh, unusual. And we have received a lot of recognition for the work that we've been able to accomplish over the last four years. And that's just the beginning. What I would like to do moving forward is anytime that we are looking at improving programs and services for native Portlanders, that we bring in this issue and that we think through and map what is, how is this issue tied uh, to uh, the boarding school history? And how can we be an ally in addressing those harms and ensuring that future generations of native people are able to heal and reclaim their culture? I look forward to continuing this work and uh, we'll be reaching out uh, to your offices once we uh, begin to plan for the training. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, Director Fraley and guests, uh, Anna Marie and Patsy, thank you for joining us today and thank you for your heartfelt and important testimony. I appreciate all of you coming to speak today. Obviously, Indigenous Peoples Day is an opportunity to spend time and to learn more about tribal people and those who identify as Indigenous globally, not just here in the city of Portland, but in indeed all around the world. Activating the city's core value of anti-racism, Indigenous People Day signifies a shift in how the narrative of the United States is understood. The Indigenous Peoples Day gives us the opportunity to recognize the first peoples of this land and to create an opportunity to analyze historical inequities. This year, our country's dark history of Indian boarding schools has been brought to the forefront of the call for action amongst Indigenous communities. And the stories that we heard today underscore the reality of one of the uglier parts of our nation's history. And only through the acknowledgement and the recognition of the truth of that history do we have the opportunity to move forward together. In our commitment to being an ally to Indian country, the city's elevating awareness of the impact of federal boarding schools on all Native Americans. These schools have caused tremendous harm and intergenerational trauma to indigenous peoples and it's created systems that are set up to in fact benefit others. We need to understand how this history has impacted indigenous peoples and to identify ways that we right here locally in our city can do uh, to be better allies in doing our part to ensure that the work that we do is strategic, that it's rooted in positive incomes for indigenous peoples and that we hold ourselves accountable to specific actions. This week, the city is providing our third annual tribal relations employee training to continue to build foundational knowledge of tribal governments, sovereignty, treaty rights, and serving the needs of indigenous Portlanders. Next month, we'll be inviting tribal governments in the region to our third annual Tribal Nations Summit to engage with the city, nurture diplomatic relationships, and identify opportunities for positive partnerships. Today, I'll ask all of you to hold space to identify how we can improve conditions for indigenous peoples. Laura, I wanna thank you again for your outstanding leadership of our Office of Tribal Relations. Uh, you uh, came in with lofty expectations and a lot of pressure put on your shoulders. And I want you to know, for me personally, you have greatly exceeded those lofty expectations. And I thank you for your service. And at this time, I'll turn it over to my colleagues uh, for their comments. And we'll just do it in the order it's on my screen. Commissioner Hardesty, you're up first. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mayor, and thank you so much for this incredible um, program today. 
Um, I, I want to appreciate all the speakers who came today. Um, and I want to especially appreciate Laura John. Uh, when I came here, this one woman dynamo was doing some incredible work all over the state of Oregon. Um, and it is reflected in how many local governments now have a tribal affairs office and are now looking intentionally at how they engage with native populations. Um, and Lord John, that would not have happened without you. There's absolutely no question about that. Uh, the one woman show is just incredible. Um, and I am happy that the council supported you in beefing up your staff and your budget so that we could be more intentional about making sure for the long term, we are in fact um, building those relationships. Um, and um, so, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I had a lot that I was gonna say about Indigenous Peoples Day, um, but the presentation that you made today about the graves have just kind of locked me, right? Um, the reality is, is that the US has a lot of ugly history um, and if we don't bring it out in the forefront and acknowledge that it happened, we will never ever either heal from it or we will not be able to move forward more intentional about including more people. We're really good about talking about equity and inclusion, uh, but we're not that good at actually walking our talk. Um, and so I just wanna appreciate each and every one of you for making space to be here today to share this very painful history. And I can commit myself, I certainly will not allow us to forget this history and we'll do all I can to help you uplift this story so that people have knowledge and knowledge is power. Thank you again for being here. And my special thanks to you, Lord John, um, cause I just know how hard you've worked over the years. Uh, to build real relationships, you know? It's one thing to say that you know Native people. It's another thing to say you have a relationship as is different as night and day. So thank you so much for all you do every day and a happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Next up is Commissioner Mapps. Um, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, I'd like to start out by thanking Tribal Relations and our guest speakers for these uh, those powerful presentations. And I also want to say that I'm delighted to join this council in declaring October 12, 2021 to be Indigenous Peoples Day here in Portland. The purpose of this holiday is to celebrate Native American people, Native cultures, and Native American history. It's particularly appropriate for Portland to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Humans have been living in this space that we know as Portland for about 11,000 years. Some of those first people were known by names that are still familiar to us today. There were the Clackamas, the Multnomah, and the Tualatin peoples, amongst others. In fact, until the middle of the 19th century, most of the people who lived in the Oregon territories were Native Americans. Now that changed with the Oregon Donation Land Act of 1850, which sees 2.5 million acres of tribal lands, including all of what is now Portland, and offered that land to white settlers for free. Now, Native Americans are not just part of Portland's past. Native Americans are very much part of who we are today. Today, more than 70,000 indigenous people live in the greater Portland area, which makes us the ninth largest urban Indian population in the United States. And even today, indigenous Portlanders face enormous challenges and discrimination. For example, today, poverty rates amongst Native Americans in the Portland metro area are twice as high as the poverty rates amongst their white neighbors. Native unemployment rates are 70% higher than the unemployment rates for white Portlanders. In Portland, more than half of Native students do not graduate from high school. And Indigenous Portlanders are the victims of violent crime at rates 250% higher than whites. Now, despite these challenges, 
Native Americans have made enormous contributions to Portland's economy and culture. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more about Native American culture here in Oregon, I encourage you to visit the Oregon Historical Society and the Portland Art Museum, which hosts excellent exhibits on Native American art, history, and culture. And if you want to participate in this year's Indigenous Peoples Day, there are several events you can attend. For example, on October 7th, the Native American Youth and Family Center is hosting a panel on running for office, which you can watch on Zoom. On October 10th and 11th, the Office of Community and Civic Life is sponsoring an Indigenous Peoples Day celebration at Friendly House. And on October 14th, Maya is sponsoring Native Made Pop Up in the Cully neighborhood. I encourage all Portlanders to attend these events, and I encourage all Portlanders to join me in observing this year's Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. Commissioner Ryan. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, uh, Laura John, um, for your leadership. I've been here for a year, and the impact that you have on the consciousness, the soul of our government in the city of Portland is um, you're, you're, you're really having a big impact to you and your team. And it's not just today. Today it's pretty um, overwhelming, and uh, so my prepared remarks suddenly seem toned up. But I, um, I just really thank you. I thank you for leaning in when I uh, want to work and understand climate justice better. And so there isn't an issue where the wisdom of the indigenous Native American people um, isn't called forth. And so weaving that into our system, so it's not just this day, but it's throughout the year. Is something I experienced. And then with your colleague now, um, Brianna Fraley, it's, it's even more amplified. And thank you so much to have guests such as Anna Marie Allen and, and you, um, Patsy Whitefoot, thank you so much for, for your presentation today. <clears throat> I wanted to just um, take my remarks and cut them down a little bit. I'm actually really uh, am proud of the work that the Northwest Portland area Indian Health Board has proven during this pandemic. I think um, there are a lot of grim stories about how we've responded to the pandemic in relationship to racial equity and uh, marginalized communities. And I've just noticed how the Indian Health Board has been a leader and how the outreach to tribes throughout the region has been stellar. And I don't think it's uh, been lifted up enough. So I wanted to use my little moment here at this meeting to lift up that organization and the great work that they're doing in your communities. And I'm also a proud uncle because my niece, Ticey Mason, is a leader at that organization on the staff. Um, I also want to acknowledge something I just experienced of on Monday night. I was um, at a friend's house for dinner. They both happen to be transplants from the East Coast. And their daughter's a sophomore at Grant High School and US history was the topic. And boy, did she school all of us on um, the real history. So when I was listening to unlearning so we can learn, that's what was experienced at the dinner table that night. And it was so powerful to see their daughter just a couple of years after bat mitzvah. So her confidence is there and she just laid into all of us um, and gave us the, the right, the real history. And it became the dialogue for an hour at dinner. And so that made, that made me so um, happy and because that was not the history that I learned in the late 70s in Portland Public Schools. So there are moments um, where you can see that things are getting better. And finally, I want to acknowledge my chief of staff, Kelly Torres, who is a Native American indigenous leader in this city. And every day I'm blessed to um, Basically, if I do what Kelly says, then I'm serving the city of Portland <laughs> so well. So thank you, Kelly Torres. I really appreciate you. And again, thanks for being here today. Excuse me, Mayor, point of order. I was just wondering why Monica Schultz was had her hands up and- um, uh, Mona has her hand up because Commissioner Rubio could not be present today. And so she has prior approval to uh, speak on behalf of Commissioner Rubio. Uh, thank you. I was just trying to figure out what's going on here. Did I miss something? Thank you. No, no. Uh, Mona, you're you. up. Okay. And why, why don't you introduce yourself as well for the record so yes, people totally know who you are. Thank you. 
Mona Schwartz, I'm a policy advisor for Commissioner Rubio, who unfortunately is not able to be here today, asked me to share this short statement on her behalf. So from Commissioner Rubio, this is an important day and I'm glad that we are honoring our nation's indigenous history. Acknowledging it as we are doing through this proclamation is an important step to learn the truth of our history. And specifically in June, we acknowledge the trauma that the Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools inflicted on native children and their families. I'd su I had suggested then that we as elected officials should fully educate ourselves about this and that I would be reaching out to Laura John and her tribal relations team about potential opportunities. Tomorrow's tribal summit, as the mayor mentioned, is one such opportunity, and I would encourage my colleagues to attend. I would also like us to follow the lead of the Seattle City Council and pass a resolution formally recognizing the trauma inflicted by these boarding schools, and I will work with Laura John and her team to see this through. This resolution is a call to action. It is our responsibility to engage, learn, and participate in our own work to dismantle systemic racism and the legacy of colonialism in this country. Thank you, Mona, appreciate it. Colleagues, it's now my privilege to read a proclamation on behalf of the City Council, the 2021 Indigenous Peoples Day Proclamation. Whereas, the city of Portland recognizes that the indigenous people of the lands that would later become known as the Americas have occupied these lands since time immemorial. Whereas the city of Portland exists at the confluence of the Willamette and Columbia rivers, which hold a rich and beautiful history of being home to villages and trade routes to the indigenous people that have been in relation with the land long before the westward expansion of European American settlements in this country. And whereas indigenous people continue to advocate passionately for their community, way of life, and the well being of the land they have been stewards of since time immemorial. And whereas the city of Portland will integrate indigenous knowledge and perspective into both practices and policy to combat the institutional racism impacting indigenous people who continue to face hardships as a result of centuries of neglectful policies and actions responsible for the present day disproportionate outcomes in health, education, and economic mobility. And whereas on October 7th, 2015, Portland City Council passed a resolution resolving that the city of Portland shall recognize Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October and whereas the city recognizes the intergenerational harm that's been caused by the federal Indian boarding school policies, which separated children from their families and led to the loss of culture, language, and connection to in the indigenous ways of life, calling for continued regional support of Secretary of Interior Deb Howland's federal Indian boarding school initiative, and whereas the city supports the Department of the Interior's Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative in partnership with tribal nations and organizations to form a National Truth and Reconciliation Commission and to act as an ally in raising awareness about this history. And whereas the 2021 Indigenous Peoples Day shall be used to express a commitment to the prosperity and well being of the Indigenous people through city policies practices, advocacy, and investments that ensure greater access to historically sacred lands and opportunity for communal collaboration on city initiatives while honoring our nation's indigenous history and contributions. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, mayor of the city of Portland, the city of Roses, do hereby proclaim October 11th, 2021 to be Indigenous Peoples Day in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you. And Director John, thank you again. To the regular agenda, Keelan, item number 734, please. Accept the Chief Procurement Officer's recommendation of a contract award to General Sheet Metalworks, Inc. 
in amount not to exceed $1,241,570 for the installation of source captured exhaust systems and fire stations. Colleagues, on September 22nd of 2020, Portland Fire and Rescue was awarded the 2019 Assistance to Firefighters Grant. This grant provides $1,167,544 for the installation of source capture exhaust systems in 31 fire stations around Portland. These systems limit firefighters' occupational exposure to diesel exhaust emissions and other carcinogens that can pose various health risks. This report recommends that this installation contract be awarded to General Sheet Metal Works Incorporated. Chief Procurement Officer Biko Taylor is here to present the report. Welcome Biko. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. So um, regarding this ordinance in question RP1573, um, we were, we publicly advertised this opportunity and received um, bids from three um, organizations in this in the region, American Heating, General Sheet Metal, Widener, and Widener Fire. Um, and we had five evaluators um, evaluating the assessment criteria for each. Uh, General Sheet Metal um, performed well in the areas of proposals, capabilities, um, cost, um, and also their project team and an approach and understanding of the scope of the project. So um, they were um, by far the um, the winning bidder by evaluation based on the evaluation criteria set forward. Nico, does that conclude your presentation? That completes my presentation and I'm willing and ready to answer questions regarding this award. Good, and and while, uh, just before I forget, because Commissioner Ryan just pinged me, um, I, I also, uh, and Mona, I should have said this when you were speaking, I want to acknowledge Commissioner Rubio is not uh, absent today. She's actually representing the council as we speak in the DOJ negotiations around the settlement agreement. Um, she had agreed to go this morning. I will be going later this afternoon. So I, I didn't want people to think she did not uh, want to be here. I'm sure she would much rather be here with us than in the DOJ negotiations. But I, I wanted to acknowledge she is, she is doing the good work on behalf of the council uh, this morning. Um, Commissioner Hardesty has some questions or comments, Biko. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, uh, Director Taylor. Uh, fabulous to have you here presenting the first time, I believe, in your role with a, with a contract. Um, I appreciate your description of the process that you went through, but what I didn't hear was what was our expectations for minority and women-owned firms to participate in this contract, and what was the outcome of minority and women-owned participation? Um, the expectation was that we would um, give the minority community every opportunity to bid and compete for this work. Um, Commissioner Hardesty, I don't have the exact good faith effort number that was that we were aspiring to, but I know that we did do a pretty um, deep dive into the COVID uh, database for uh, minority firms to perform in this area. Um, I think on the surface, it looks like an HVAC contract, but there is nuance to the niche um, scope of, of around exhaust um, scope requirements. Exactly. So, it, you know, it's, it's HVAC, but it also has some niche. In our research through the COVID firms, we were only able to find one um, MBE firm that um, met the criteria for that, and we, and we reached out. Um, so I think you know, from a perspective of good faith efforts, you know, we want to maximize participation. Um, in this instance, there were not firms on the COVID list, but we are in the process of, you know, going to a deeper level of understanding with NIGP codes, et cetera, to, to represent that community in a more comprehensive manner moving forward. 
so thank you for that, Director Taylor. But I want to be clear, uh, we don't have to just use minority and women to fulfill a aspirational goal. Um, any other subcontracts that aren't giving white uh, or majority firms extra points, we still could use minority firms. I think the city has been very narrowly focused on COVID because it is a system that's easy. Um, and we can't do easy because easy hasn't worked. And so anytime a proposal comes that I can't see myself, what the due diligence was on the contract, I'm going to pull it off consent and I'm going to ask these questions publicly. Um, I know uh, you know the challenges that we have in procurement right now, but uh, we can't just keep doing it this way and then expect sometime in the future to get different outcomes. So I appreciate, I know you're a new kid on the block, uh, but you are also experienced. And um, so this is just how I roll. Every time I see a contract, for public dollars that are is not inclusive of a broader community. Um, I, I expect better, and I know you will do better uh, once you've had an opportunity to evaluate uh, what you have now. Um, so yeah, this is not, I, I, I need to see that information. I shouldn't have to ask for it. Thank you. Yep, I take full responsibility for that. Moving forward, we will at the very least provide more clarity yes. to the process and also do our best to look outside of COVID for firms that are disadvantaged but may not have COVID certification. So I take full responsibility. I know I'm new, but this is my department and I intend to own that. I so appreciate hearing that. You don't know what a breath of fresh air that is for me, Director Taylor, to hear you say that. Um, and yes, I look forward to you using your uh, experience to actually just uh, totally revolutionize how we do contracting at the city of Portland. So. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Artisty. Uh, I want to second that. That speaks to your uh, that speaks to your character, Biko. Thank you for for saying the buck stops with you. We we all have a role to play in it. Um, we're 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 here to be held accountable as well. Um, so we're we're all on this together. Uh, but thank you for your leadership and the way you're presenting yourself today. It is it is noted and it is greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Any other questions, colleagues? If not, I'll entertain a motion to accept the report. So moved. We have a motion from Commissioner Ryan. Can I get a second, please? Second. Second from Commissioner Maps. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll on the report. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Welcome aboard, Director Taylor. Aye. Hardesty. Um, I appreciate your ownership of your bureau. Um, and today I will vote yes on this very reluctantly um, because I know that we need to get this work done. Um, but I'm looking forward to the next one you bring me that I can be excited about as we move forward. I vote aye. Wheeler. I want to uh, thank you, Director Taylor. I want to thank the Fire Bureau for their partnership on this. Uh, obviously, this is a must-have. It, it obviously supports the health and well-being of our employees. Happy to support it. I vote aye. The report is accepted. Next item is second reading, item 735. Amend solid waste and recycling collection code to update definitions and add exceptions to the residential franchise to allow special items collection, bottle bill, container collection, and junk removal services. Colleagues, we heard a presentation on this. There's been opportunity for public comment. This is a second reading. Any further discussion on this item? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Yeah, actually, I want to just uh, take a moment to uh, thank Commissioner Rubio and her staff and DPS for bringing this uh, ordinance forward. I certainly learned a lot last week at the hearing or at the first reading. Um, it's clear to me that we are if we are to achieve a greener future, waste mitigation will be a long-term effort and that crucial recycling services like Ridwell and others are needed in our city without disruption. I also recognize that there is more work to be done and I want to commend Commissioner Rubio for committing to taking a more holistic approach next year to delve deeper into Portland's entire waste and recycling code. I vote aye. Hardesty. I also want to appreciate Commissioner uh, Rubio's leadership on uh, bringing this resolution forward. Uh, and um, I'm sorry, this ordinance forward. 
Um, it is important that we are not so locked into the ways we've always done things that we cannot adapt to new innovation. And uh, this, uh, these changes allow for innovative uh, creativity to take place in our waste management uh, process. Uh, I'm very happy to vote aye in favor of moving this forward and look forward to continuing to work with uh, callers to make sure that we are creating opportunities, especially in communities of color and for women business owners. I vote aye. Wheeler. Happy to vote aye. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rubio, for for your hard work on this and uh, to her team. I vote aye. The ordinance is adopted. Next item, 736, also a second reading. Approve application under the multiple unit limited tax exemption program under the inclusionary housing program for East Burnside Apartments located at 2202 East Burnside Street. Is there any further discussion on this second reading? Seeing none, please call the roll. Maps. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Hardesty. Um, good word, Commissioner Ryan. I vote aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Back to the consent agenda, uh, item number 732. Amend human resources administrative rule funeral and bereavement leave to define and clarify eligibility for leave. Colleagues, due to how this policy change came about, Commissioner Maps and I felt that this item deserved some discussion as well as recognition of our city employees. For this item, we're first going to hear from the Bureau of Human Resources about technical changes as well as from the city attorney's office about legal changes. And finally, from a few of our city employees who are involved about how this policy change recommendation came about as well as the possible impact it will have. Before I turn it over to Ashley Grundy, our Deputy Director of the Bureau of Human Resources, I want to express my sincere appreciation to our city employees who will be bravely sharing some of their personal experiences today. I want to thank them for being here to uh, shed more light onto this issue. It's rare that we get up here about the potential impacts of our HR policies and we can how we can better support the well-being of our employees. To my fellow commissioners, I'd ask that we please hold questions until the very end. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Ashley Grundy. Welcome, Ashley. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you. My name is Ashley Grundy, and I'm the Deputy Director of Human Resources. It's truly my privilege to share updates to the Human Resources Administrative Rule 6.08, which is our bereavement leave policy. A redline version of the rule changes was submitted to each of you prior to this session. As a person who identifies as a lesbian with close relationships to extended and chosen family, this policy update is personal. In the past months, I've lost members of my own family who did not meet the definition of relative within our current rule. As a representative of the Bureau of Human Resources, it is our goal to improve our processes, policies, and procedures to reflect a commitment to improving the experience of our intersectional workforce. Currently, a work group comprised of stakeholders across the city are working to review and recommend updates to our HR administrative rules with the goal of incorporating the core values. This work is being conducted with deep thought and consideration However, urgency surrounding the expansion of the bereavement leave policy exists. The updates of the bereavement leave policy exemplify the value of collaboration and the importance of the city's affinity groups. Through the leadership of the LGBTQIA and Friends Affinity Group, a request was submitted to BHR to expand the policy and expedite adoption of an updated rule. Given the significant amount of grief and loss many have experienced through the pandemic, personal circumstances, and unexpected trage tragedies, the sense of urgency was palpable. In full transparency, the rule updates were drafted by our affinity group members and forwarded to BHR. Thank you to all who collaborated on these vital updates to the policy. The fiscal impact of this rule change may have a small impact in personnel costs. The potential cost is not fully quantifiable as a 
prior to the expansion of this rule, it's likely a person experiencing a loss beyond the current definition of relative utilize sick time or vacation leave. In addition, overtime and loss in productivity may be factors in evaluating fiscal impact, which is the same for the prior rule. The cost of not expanding this rule, however, may be quantified by exclusion of members of our workforce whose chosen family differ from the def definition of relatives and may choose to not take the time necessary to grieve as a result of a narrow policy. Changes to the rule include the definition of close affinity, which Deputy City Attorney Ann Milligan will review in a moment, and inclusion of pregnancy loss, including miscarriage, stillbirth, or other loss, which Michelle Rodriguez will discuss. BHR is working with our labor partners to craft memorandums of understanding to ensure all represented staff have access to the expanded bereavement leave as well. This rule will continue to apply to temporary staff employed by the City of Portland. You may note, as mentioned by Mayor Willer, it is not standard process for a rule update with limited fiscal impact to review, be reviewed by council accompanied by testimony. However, we felt it important for council to hear the testimony of why this change is so vital. Expanding our bereavement leave not only honors our current workforce, but also differentiates the city as a destination employer for future hires. Again, thank you to the LGBTQIA plus friends and affinity group and Michelle Rodriguez for your advocacy and leadership. I will now transition to Deputy City Attorney Ann Milligan, who will review the legal implications for the rule changes and who also played a pivotal role in drafting the policy and moving it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I am Deputy City Attorney Ann Milligan in the City Attorney's Office. I am currently City's sole employment litigator, as well as, as you may know, the City's Advice Attorney for the 2021 Pay Equity Audit that we are currently engaged in. To be clear, I created the first draft of the proposed amended policy before you today not in my capacity as an advice attorney for the city, but as a member of the LGBTQIA plus and friends affinity group. I make this distinction both so you're clear on my role today, guiding us through the proposed HRAR 6.08, and to emphasize the important work that city's affinity groups do. As a bi gray ace and a former teenage runaway who escaped the millennial end of times cult, the concept and reality of chosen families is of inexpressible importance to me. Members of my chosen family are my durable power of healthcare attorney, my power of attorney, and are accounted for in my will. My biological family is not. My chosen family is my true family, and this has been the case for decades. When the LGBTQIA and friends group expressed that they did not see themselves in many of our HR policies, particularly but not limited to our bereavement policy, I was elated to see a way to merge my legal subject matter expertise and my affinity interests to make meaningful change at city in the lives of our employees by allowing them to honor the lives and deaths of those closest to them. The first major change that you'll notice in the proposed HRER 6.08 is the addition of close affinity language. Formerly, the policy only allowed employees bereavement leave for very narrowly defined relatives that only favored particular types of families. Historically, family definitions in law and policy have often failed to meet the reality and needs of families in the United States, and they frequently still fall short today. According to the Center for American Progress, 85 million people disproportionately people of color live in extended families as of 2014, up from 58 million in 2001. People have a broad array of loved ones who are now central to their notions of family and caregiving responsibilities. In particular, although the LGBTQ movement successfully achieved nationwide marriage equality in 2015, LGBTQ individuals and families continue to experience the collateral consequences of narrow family definitions in local, state, and federal policy. 
and would gain significantly from more inclusive definitions of family in workplace leave policies such as HRAR 6.08. Many LGBTQ individuals forge close relationships with friends and informal support networks known as chosen families, especially since LGBTQ people too often face extreme stigma within their own biological families and communities. The close affinity language that we have proposed in draft HRAR 6.08 honors this reality and comes with significant legal precedent. During the Vietnam War, for instance, federal regulations were amended to allow federal employees to take funeral leave for the combat-related death of immediate relatives, including anyone that they were related to by, quote, blood or affinity, whose close association with the employee was the equivalent of a family relationship. Similar language to that contained within our policy is also included in the Oregon Paid Family Leave Act, which is coming online in the very near future. The revisions to HRAR 6.08 also reflect City Resolution 37175, adopting the use of gender neutral language in city policies. Rather than daughter or son, for instance, the defined relatives portion of the policy now simply reads child. All defined relatives have now been made gender neutral in the policy so that all of our employees can see themselves and their family members in the policy regardless of their identification within the gender binary. I'm happy to answer any other legal or substantive questions council has about the changes specifically to the defined relatives or the close affinity leave. Otherwise, I will hand it off to Michelle Rodriguez, Senior Policy Advisor to Commissioner Maps, who contributed critical changes to HRER 6.08 after the initial draft from LGBTQ and Friends. Um, her changes made this a truly comprehensive, even more deeply meaningful policy. Thank you, Anne. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. For the record, my name is Michelle Rodriguez, and I'm a Senior Policy Advisor for Commissioner Maps. I previously worked in Portland Parks and Recreation in the Office of Community and Civic Life. I share my previous roles to help you understand I've spent nearly seven years as a city employee, and this policy hits close to home, as over those seven years, my family has experienced more than one loss. Early in the summer, I was made aware that the LGBTQIA plus affinity group had been working on some language updates to this policy, and I asked if it was okay to jump in with language related to pregnancy loss. I had read news out of New Zealand that Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern had passed a national bereavement leave law and was inspired to work on something at the local level. Using that law as a starting point and in collaboration with city staff who privately bravely shared with me their traumatic loss experiences, we drafted what I think a more inclusive policy. Let me share some statistics with you. Approximately one in four women experience at least one miscarriage in their lives. And in the United States, one out of every 160 deliveries ends in stillbirth. This rate is almost twice as high for black and native women. Fertility loss rates are even higher, and in some cases, up to 85% chance of loss, resulting in parents facing long, arduous, expensive processes, never being given a chance to grieve. Finally, one in four women, the same statistic as for miscarriage, will end their pregnancy via medical termination. The reasons vary from health of the mother, loss of fetal viability, or other personal reasons. We know the loss of any pregnancy can result in both physical and psychological pain with families often suffering in silence due to the stigma they face. We updated this policy language to be as inclusive as possible, covering all kinds of loss. We did this so at a moment of vulnerability and grief, staff aren't worrying about having enough vacation or sick days to take time off to grieve, nor should they be made, worried to, nor should they be made to worry if the loss they suffered mattered in the eyes of their employer. We also wanted to give them an opportunity to talk about this loss. And finally, we did this to give managers and supervisors tools they need to support their staff. October is National Pregnancy Loss Awareness Month, so it is only fitting on this first week of October that we recognize all of the City of Portland families who have suffered this loss. Thank you for this opportunity to update this policy. I want to say a special thanks to Anne for her tireless work on this policy and her partnership. And finally, I want to thank our um, speakers, Bonnie, Julia, and Zue, who are willing to share their stories. I'll hand it back over to Anne. Thank you, Michelle. 
With that, I would like to introduce Bonnie Cushman, who is the first of three city employees today to give testimony. Um, she is going to discuss the impacts of the proposed addition of pregnancy loss bereavement leave to HRAR 6.08. Hello, my name is Bonnie Cushman, and I wanted to thank you for the opportunity um, to share my story with you today. As someone who has suffered two miscarriages before having our beautiful daughter, Hazel, this policy is incredibly important to me. In my experience, pregnancy loss is something that leaves a permanent mark on you, and this new policy is a very concrete way that the city can help support its employees when they are grieving the loss of their unborn child. It took my husband, Mark, and I seven years and many trials to have Hazel. The journey was exhausting and, a, and an emotional roller coaster. After several years of trying to conceive naturally, we turned to intrauterine insemination or IUI, which was followed by the devastating news that my eggs were not viable and that we would have had a less than 1% chance of getting pregnant with them. This left us with three choices, decide to forego parenthood, adoption, or to try in vitro fertilization or IVF with a donor's eggs. We chose the latter and my parents generous, generously gave us some money to help cover the very expensive cost and my sister was our egg donor. We got one viable embryo and it took, I was pregnant. We had a chance for a child with our genetics from both families. Then at six weeks pregnant, I miscarried. We were devastated. After much deliberation, we decided to try again. This meant finding another egg donor, many more expenses and rolling the dice for a chance at, a parent, at parenthood. This time we had six viable embryos. We transferred one and again it took, I was pregnant. This one lasted seven weeks and again, we were devastated. We decided that we could emotionally and financially afford one more shot at having a baby through IVF. It was a pregnancy fraught with the worry of potential loss and weekly appointments to monitor the baby's health. It was ultimately successful and Hazel was born, excuse me, a month early and is just about to turn to seven this month. She is our miracle baby. Throughout this process that I just shared with you, I learned personally how common pregnancy loss is, how lonely it can be because it's not openly talked about often in our society. I learned personally how devastating this can be as an expected parent. I was fortunate to be part of a work group here at the city that was very supportive of my taking personal leave time to grieve the loss of our two failed pregnancies. At a time when so many women's rights are under attack across the country and when the pandemic has forced so many more women from the workforce, having a city policy that publicly recognizes the loss, this loss as worthy of bereavement leave is a powerful signal to women working for the city. Thank you. Thank you so much for your vulnerability, Bonnie. With that, I would like to transition to Ju Juliet Merlicoli, sorry, Merlicoli, who will begin to frame the issue of real world problems facing city employees as a result of HRER 6.08, narrow definition of relative in the current bereavement leave policy, and how the proposed revisions would remove the barriers that Juliet and others like her have experienced in the past at city employment. Thanks, Anne. Thanks, everyone. And Bonnie, thanks for your story as well. Um, this past spring, my dad passed away suddenly in Southern Oregon, leaving behind a partner who was medically fragile and emotionally distraught as she navigated the sudden loss of the love of her life. Um, and with no other family near enough to help support her, it became my role to make the trip south to help her as best and as often as I could while grieving the loss of my dad myself. <clears throat> 
I took and was grateful for five days of paid funeral leave. I spent <clears throat> I spent most of my energies those days wondering and worrying how my brother and I would care for my dad's partner. While they were never legally married, she and my dad had been together for over 20 years and we were family. Sorry. <clears throat> Explored applying for FMLA to take days off to make frequent trips down to care for her. And upon inquiring with HR about receiving leave, I was told my circumstances didn't qualify because she had been, while she had been in my life for 20 years, she wasn't legally my stepmother. My workaround was to change my work schedule to a 410 hour to 410s so that I had every Monday off and could make trips down on the weekends. Six weeks later, she passed away as well. While the double grief was its own burden to bear for me, it was also a moment of enlightenment about the archaic definitions of our current leave policies and how many people have been left behind. If this had been my experience as a cisgender white woman with a family whose structure and dynamic is somewhat average, imagine how much harder these circumstances are for our friends experiencing a loss that doesn't fall into what has been defined as in the rules as, quote, family or a loss that doesn't include, quote, a funeral. Expanding how the city of Portland defines family and loss in this realm is a powerful next step towards more inclusion. Thank you to the LGBTQI plus A plus affinity group, our human resources team and the city attorney and to all of you on city council. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that story with us, Juliet. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce Zulema Figueroa, who will close out the testimony on HRAR 6108, framing one of the ways that our current policy does not reflect the cultural reality of all of our employees' families and how the proposed revisions would remove the obstacles Zulema's, Zulema and others have experienced in the past at City. Thank you, and good morning, City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to share my story this morning. <clears throat> Uh, pandemic or not, workers did not receive much tied to more the death of immediate family member at the city of Portland. My cousin died of COVID-19 in July this year, which was very sad news for the family. My cousin and I grew up together and we're very close, so I consider him like a second brother. When I heard the news, I felt that I wanted to take a plane to be with, with the family in California. Unfortunately, most funeral services just were allowing spouses and their children for COVID precautions. I notified my immediate supervisor about the situation. I just mentioned that a family member died and I needed to take some time, some days off uh, work, you know, off from work. So for the family virtual funeral gatherings, I wasn't specific about which family member died during this time. I didn't have time to think about bearing policy, bringing policy, uh, because my heart and my soul was with my family. Excuse me. I got three days off and I felt that it wasn't enough time to gather with La Familia because I just had time for a virtual family reunion to mourn a little bit. So I wish I had more time with family and friends to share with others, with others the memories and good things that my cousin did when he was alive. Consequently, consequently, I follow up on my own time off with traditions that we have in El Salvador. When someone dies, their family has a novena for nueve días, prayer rosary for nine days, and light a candle for um, more with a picture of the family member who has passed. Other Latinx countries had those tradi traditions as well. Uh, Marguerite War, correspondent at the Business Insider, wrote in her 2020 article, American jobs aren't allowing a grieving nation the time needed to mourn the death of the loved ones. I quote, in the U.S., there is no law granting workers the right to pay time off to attend a law, a law excuse me, a loved one's funeral or process the trauma or loss in a family member. Dream and leave is up to the discretion of employers. Most American workers receive only three days to grieve the loss of a close family member. Some receive none. But grief takes more than a handful of days to contend with. 
Meanwhile, coronavirus pandemic has taken the life of 700,000 Americans. City employers should have the opportunity to take these uh, take days when any immediate family member passes, not just necessarily close relatives such as a mother, father, et cetera, but other members as well, like cousins, aunts, or uncle, et cetera. La Familia is very important for city workers. I was very lucky to have three days off work, but other workers are not so lucky to get time off to more their immediate family members. That is why I am in support of the changes in this Britman policy by adding affinity members, family members to it. And I invite you to support too. That will benefit all city workforce. And thank you. Thank you, Zulema, for that. Thank you also to Bonnie and Juliet for sharing your stories and being vulnerable before council today, you know, to paraphrase. Um, uh, Brene Brown, vulnerability is the most expensive gift that anyone can give. Uh, so thank you for giving that gift to the city today. Um, with that, um, thank you, Council, for your consideration. We will open the floor for any questions. Very good. Uh, I want to thank all of the people who presented, Ashley and Michelle, Bonnie, Juliet, Zhu, and thank you for sharing your stories. Uh, you know, these, these items sometimes make it onto the consent agenda and they seem like they're just run of the mill items, but behind this one, there are real people and many, many stories. And this came to us through the uh, employees. And I wanna thank you for being here today and leading this. Um, colleagues, this is a first reading and I know we all have comments we'd like to make uh, while we have our employees here in the room. So what, we can take that time to do so today. I'll start with Commissioner Hardesty, then Commissioner Maps, then Commissioner Ryan, and then I've got some comments I'd like to follow up with too. Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Ashley, uh, Gillette, Bonnie, Zhu, and, um, and Michelle uh, for your um, uh, really a hot moving testimony today. Um, it takes a lot to um, bring what your personal lived experiences are, especially to this body as the council. And I just want you to know how grateful I am that you took the time um, to share your personal stories. Um, my question really is around the fiscal impact that we're told there isn't one. And I hope that between now and the next week, I can get some information from human resources because we've passed policies in the past that we've been told had no fiscal impact. And we've learned later that in fact, it did have a significant fiscal impact. Again, nothing about the policy, the issue. It's just that I wanna make sure as a city council member that I understand the financial impact that this will have on the city's budget. Um, and I, I didn't want to have that conversation today, not with all these personal stories here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, following up and learning more about being intentional about identifying what the fiscal impact is. And honestly, let me just say whatever it is, it's worth it for us to have this policy. But I, I've been uh, shocked in the past when we passed policy and we were told there was no fiscal impact and we learned later it was significant. So. I just need to get that question answered before we vote next week. But thank you again all for being here and sharing your personal stories. Um, we are moving in the right direction and we just have to be intentional and know um, uh, uh, the resources that we will need to move in that direction. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Maps. Um, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, I wanna thank our speakers, Bonnie, Juliet, and Zue for sharing their stories with us today that took courage. I also want to thank all the city staff who worked on this administrative rule, um, especially Michelle Rodriguez on my team, Ann Milligan in the city attorney's office, uh, Sarah P. Allen in the mayor's office, Debbie Castleton uh, with the deep executive team, and staff at BES and the many staff at BHR who reviewed and collaborated on this work. Um, finally, I'd like to recognize the LGBTQIA plus 
City Parents and Women's Empowerment Affinity Group for their important work on this very important project. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to voting aye on this item. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan. Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, that was powerful. Thank you so much, all of you, for showing up. Uh, your vulnerability was powerful. And uh, that's really how we uh, move hearts and minds. So thank you, Ashley, Anne, Juliet, Michelle, Zoe, oh, Bonnie. I really hope I didn't forget anyone. And I also want to lift up the affinity group, the LGBTQI plus affinity group. I just have to uh, reminisce for a second. I remember what it was like to be um, climbing in my career and, want, and needing to go to a lot of funerals in the late 80s and early 90s because of the AIDS pandemic and how there were a few instances where I, um, I just called in sick because I didn't want to have to explain and I didn't want to be told that I couldn't go. Um, so this is meaningful to me from my lived experience. Uh, when I had a chance to run an organization, you just believe people when they tell you who their family is, period. And you also, um, as you do life and you've experienced a lot of grief and loss yourself, you know this whole three days thing is bananas. So um, it's, uh, and every culture outside of ours knows that it seems. So um, I'm just really wanna uh, lift all of you up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being present. I think the only head scratcher one on this one is that it's that the date that is it's 2021 and uh, it's a little shocking that we're finally codifying this into legislation. Uh, I look forward to um, voting aye on this issue, but I want to take a moment time to appreciate all of you for showing up and showing us your hearts. Thank you. As Anne mentioned, this change began with conversation at both the LGBTQ and Friends Deep Affinity Group. Through their collective efforts, we're making some very important changes that I'm confident will better support all of our city employees. What started out as a way to be more inclusive of our LGBTQ city employees who are more likely to have chosen families due to stigmatism and historic barriers also included pregnancy loss. This is a perfect example of how the rising tide of equity can lift all boats, in this case, the various needs of all of our city employees. The whole city benefits when we have a workforce that feel that they can bring their best selves to the workforce. I frankly feel very lucky as mayor to have such a thoughtful and dedicated group of city employees working with us and pulling in the same direction. I want to thank all of our city employees who spoke today, Ashley Grundy, Ann Milligan, Michelle Rodriguez, Bonnie Cushman, Juliet, Murakioli, and Zhu Carbio Figueroa. I also want to thank all of our other city employees who behind the scenes also worked with the LGBTQ and Friends Affinity Group, people like Debbie Castleton and with my own office, Serafie Allen, for helping to bring this forward today. Uh, thank you all for this. It is a non-emergency ordinance, so it moves to second reading, but I think I can say pretty confidently that this will get the necessary support when it comes back for its final reading next week. Thanks a lot for your efforts. And with that, colleagues, that concludes our business for this morning. We are adjourned. Have a good afternoon.